We have already discussed one of the most important, if not the most important features of a modern uh, models or all models is the confidence scores that align with the actual probability of guessing incorrectly. The reason is that we often need classifiers and pattern recognition algorithms to automate something that is currently done by humans. Even humans are not perfect and we don't expect the algorithms to be. However, instead of waiting for a new method that performs really great on all possible input cases, we can accept predictions only if the confidence is higher than a level that we are happy with. Yet, not always the confidence score returned by the models corresponds to the probability of guessing correctly. Is the problem of predicting probability estimates representative of the true correctness likelihood? So why do we do it? Uh, we want the probability associated with the predicted class label uh, to reflect its ground truth corrected, correctness. If that is the case, then we know when to trust the model and when to route that model to a human instead. Remember what we've discussed in last lecture is um, uh, that whole question of which model is better for automation. And uh, the answer is paradoxical that a model, because of different requirements, different um, obligations that we have uh, for our clients, for example, the contract on uh, sustained accuracy, uh, we may choose a model that is on overall worse than something else if we uh, consider the complete test uh, data set or even uh, the are um, actually occurring data set in the wild we may have models with with better average accuracy which are actually worse for our case if we have models that are true to their uh, prediction so um that's that's the reason uh, to have um, good calibrated models. Model interpretability is another case. Is um, precisely we want to be able to say uh, which cases are harder for our model, which cases are easier. Because, for example, again, think practically. Um, even if our model predicts correctly only 80% of cases but in the wild 20% of cases may be just plainly wrong or uh, impossible to label anyways um, just because of the use case so we want to be able the model not to return high confidence in those wrong predictions but be totally uh, unconfident so like preferably zero then we can start investigating and find a case, for example, a printer jam, I don't know, uh, some uh, specific site that is collecting data is just sending us garbage or something like that. So we want the model to be true to um, the model's confidence to be true to the accuracy of the model. So um, what, like speaking about that, that calibration and um, uh, what is the perfect calibration right so let's define uh well um you already see it on the slide but let's consider supervised uh classification problem multi-dimensional input data from multiple classes follows the joint data label distribution that can be decomposed into the data prior evidence as you know and conditional which in this form if you remember we called posterior given the data gives a, give us the labels a neural network takes a feature vector as an input and it returns class prediction y hat and confidence p hat so for a perfect calibration we need the probability of correct result at a given confidence to be equal to that confidence so how to assess whether a model is perfectly calibrated or not For that, we have the help of reliability di diagrams or calibration plots. So reliability diagrams 
are a visual representation of model calibration. These diagrams plot expected sample accuracy as a function of confidence that the model returns. If the model is perfectly calibrated, then probability of uh, the of the predicted label being the true label at given confidence equals to that confidence. That means that's the definition as we just introduced of perfectly calibrated model. Well, in this case, the diagram should plot the identity function, which is uh, just a 45 degree line, right? And any deviation from a perfect diagonal represents miscalibration. Here's an example of this diagram. So four popular classifiers. This is our perfectly calibrated line, the diagonal 45 uh, degrees. That means, say for a model uh, confidence of 0 0.6, Our accuracy is 0 0.6 and so on and so forth. 0 0.8, we want our accuracy to be 0 0.8. And we plot calibration plot uh, from this link. You will be able to look at it in your um, in, in um, the notes. I will make it available online, of course, as a PDF, as always. So you may be able to look it up. Um, uh, sklearn help files um, so what they did uh, they compared logistic regression naive base classifier support vector machine and a random forest among those four we only haven't closely uh, looked at random forest but it's basically boosted uh, decision trees um, but Anyways, uh, you, you can uh, pick it up on your own now that you know the basics. So what we have here, um, as you see from the first top plot, that logistic regression, this um, blue line here, is the closest to the perfect calibration. Surprised? Well, why does it do that? Well, of course, correct. You're right, uh, it's because it's designed to model probability distribution in the training data. So the deviations here are because we're plotting it on the test data and those are misgeneralization or the lack of generalization uh, in this case for logistic regression. But note in the frequency plot here, this, this plots are different. This is the calibration plot. What this plot tells us uh, let's take beans and bean the confidence in those beans. So if our model makes a prediction with confidence between 0 0.9 and 1, we'll place or count that prediction in this bean. And, so, and the same true for other beans. Look for logistic regression, that blue line here. Logistic regression is surprisingly uniform in assigning the labels to the uh, confidence values or returning the confidence values for the labels. To see why it's surprising, look at support vector machine. Support vector machine is uh, here. It's the green. So. 0 0.5 is the most uncertain, right? I'm not sure if it is 0 or 1 prediction. So support vector machine is uh, tending to uh, be unsure about the negative or positive prediction. And uh, say something like naive base classifier, it's quite by model, right? It's uh, super sure with in, in positive predictions and super sure in negative predictions, but it still makes mistakes. 
and that's why the calibration curve is not perfect. So I hope you got an idea of what is a calibration plot and what is this frequency plot with respect to predicted value or uh, predicted confidence. But another thing is uh, uh, the fact that SVM say is 0.5 percent or 0.5 uh, confident does it tell us that it's more accurate or less accurate does either of this plot tell us how accurate these models are no uh well the 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 top one does uh, a little bit but uh actually no wait a second it doesn't the uh, neither of them does it just tells us both plots well, especially the top one, the calibration plot or a reliability diagram, it just tells us how close um, is our model's accuracy to what its confidence is. So let's look at an interesting example. Uh, people in this paper that I will be heavily relying on in this uh, section of our uh, study of our class Notice that best performing models, deep learning models, are lying to us uh, in terms of their confidence. If we look at the top uh, row of the plots, we see distribution of the confidences uh, of the samples across confidences, let's say. And then we'll see that uh, the most modern, well, 2016 is very old by now, but still it's the modern model, the, the most modern model uh, compared to Lynette, uh, 1998. Both of them are uh, convolutional neural networks and Lynette has uh, only five layers, while ResNet uh, 2016 has 110 layers. And as you see, uh, average confidence and accuracy of Lynette are nearby. Yeah, you know, they're in the ballpark, while average confidence of ResNet is much higher than its accuracy, although its accuracy is higher than uh, the one of Lynette on the same CIFAR 100 dataset. An example, and if you look at the reliability diagram, uh, the bottom plot, the bottom two plots, the Lynette one is actually closer to ideal. There is some gap, uh, but uh, still, it's very close uh, to the diagonal one. While for ResNet. The difference is huge uh, from what's expected, the diagonal one, and uh, what the model returns. So expected accuracy and average confidence are two metrics or two things we will need um, to define to continue further in this class, in this lecture. So let V sub M be the set of indices in an interval I sub M. So basically it's a one of the beans in our histogram. And then the expected accuracy in that bean is nothing but uh, the normalized count of correct predictions in this bean. Uh, where um, this is an indicator function, it just gives us one if the prediction is correct or zero if it's incorrect uh, and um, this is the size or the of the bean or the number of um, samples that got the confidence that the model assigned confidence within the range um, for within this range for this bean that works for this bin. Uh, the average confidence within bin um, B sub M is defined, so that was ac average accuracy. And average confidence is, we just say, um, take all confidence uh, values that um, for all the samples that fall within the same bin and take their average normalized by the size of the bin. So the number of samples that fall in this bin 
then accuracy and confidence, average accuracy and average confidence, or expected average, uh, expected accuracy and average confidence, they approximate the left hand uh, and right hand uh, sides of our equations for being uh, of our uh, perfect calibration equation for being M. And a perfectly calibrated model will have expected accuracy equal average confidence. Now, let's define a metric. How can we say if one model is better than another by looking at a single number, not looking at the reliability diagram? For that, we define expected calibration error, ECE, and it's used to summarize, as I said, calibration as one statistic. One notion of miscalibration is the difference in the expectation between confidence and accuracy. So this expectation is approximated by uh, uh, absolute value of the difference between expected accuracy and average confidence. Weighted uh, by the size of the bean, uh, the basically the ratio of this bean uh, with respect to the full calibration data set, and that is expected calibration error. Then, uh, for some high risk applications, we may wish to minimize the worst case deviation between confidence and accuracy. So instead of uh, expected calibration error, we just look at the maximum, uh, and this is the maximum calibration error, MCE, which is again, you look at the difference between average, um, average confidence and um, expected accuracy, the absolute value of their difference. So uh, an, another measure that we often use and often maximize um, or uh, minimize in this case is negative log likelihood, right? We want to maximize the likelihood and uh, so we minimize negative log likelihood. And it's a standard measure of probabilistic models quality. It's an old textbook, Friedman, Hastings, Tipsharani, and that's what I cite there. And it's also referred to as the cross entropy loss in the context of deep learning, also in many books and textbooks. Uh, given a probabilistic model, pi of y given x and n samples, negative log likelihood is defined as uh, this expression, right? Um, the sum of the log of the uh, conditional probability or um, our consonants. And it's a standard result that in expectation negative log likelihood is minimized if and only if our network or our estimate of this probability distribution uh, recovers the ground truth conditional distribution pi of x given y. So what affects calibration? Uh, which, um, you know, what has changed since Lynette, which was pretty well calibrated, albeit less accurate, and what has changed now? So one, one thing that changed is we have networks with uh, much uh, larger depth and uh, width. And uh, as you see in those plots, increasing depth and width may reduce classification error, uh, but may negatively affect model calibration. So classification error goes down with depth and width, but calibration error, our expected calibration error, actually goes up with the depth. Well, with a slight dip, but um, it went much higher. So another thing that was um, introduced since LearNet is 
various normalization techniques, among which the most successful was batch normalization. And one of the effects of batch normalization is the models that train much faster and, uh, well, are slightly more accurate. Uh, but turns out, as you see here, uh, we batch normalization does reduce the model's error, but it increases miscalibration. And um, another thing is the training with less weight decay has ne negative impact on calibration. So if you don't use weight decay in your training, then um, your model tends to be more miscalibrated or poorly, poorly uh, calibrated as it stands. So how is it possible that a model has better predictive performance, higher, higher accuracy, and it's poorly calibrated? So it does look like overfitting is to blame. So if we only look at the red test error here, then test error with training with epochs goes down, and eventually even more down. But if we look at the test uh, negative log likelihood, then it decreases to a certain point and starts increasing. So the price that we pay is overfitting is um, happening in probabilistic space. So the network does not overfit in prediction accuracy, but it overfits in predicting uh, probabilities or confidences of uh, its own accuracy. That's an interesting observation from uh, 2017 paper. So what can we do? Not just for our neural networks, but for all other methods. Uh, well, we use various calibration methods, such as histogram binning, isotonic regression, Bayesian binning into quantiles, and flat scaling. So all of them, maybe, besides Bayesian, uh, maybe besides barbecue, but they all were developed for classical machine learning methods way before deep learning was uh, on the radar. That's interesting. So, oh, but the good thing for us that all of them are implemented and implemented in standard packages such, such as sklearn. The first one is histogram binning. So given uh, fixed bean boundaries, All uncalibrated prediction you know, divided into mutually exclusive bins, and we predefine those. Each bin is assigned a calibration score, which we need to estimate. If uh, th then um, at the use case when we start using it, once we have theta for each bin, if the model returns a confidence score that falls in that bin, we replace that score with the theta that we estimated. And uh, that's how we use that test time. And um, this is an uh, optimization problem. We need to minimize this function. For the first indicator is basically whether um, the confidence of the model falls within uh, the current beam. And um, then we minimize the square error, which turns out, uh, excuse me, which turns out to be uh, that the solution in theta uh, correspond to the, uh, the results in the theta for each bean that corresponds to the average number of positive class sample in each bean. That is uh, histogram binning. But we pre specified the bean width and uh, basically position of those bean dividers. Isotonic regression does basically the same, but only together with theta, so the parameters of the beans. Um, um, to be replaced uh, with which confidence needs to be replaced at the test time or at the use time. Isotonic regression estimates the number of beans and the border between beans to, together with the parameters of the beans. Well, we could be in differently, right? We could be in by um, number of uh, samples per bean, like 
equal number of uh, samples should fall within each bean, then bean will be different size. And uh, we could uh, place the bean boundaries anywhere in um, the range between 0 and 1 and choose as many beans um, as needed, depending on the number of samples, I guess. But in isotonic regression and in histogram binning, we choose one of the solution, not all of them at once. Or what Bayesian uh, barbecue uh, approach does is basically marginalize out uh, all possible binning schemes, and then we produce our prediction. So um, it's Bayesian averaging. We take the probability of um, predicting or probability of um, returning a confidence given the confidence that the model returns and model it as an average over all possible as an average over all possible binning uh, schemas. So if we can set prior on binning uh, schemas and average out all of them, then we would basically return the best overall possible Q. That's how Bayesian uh, approach works in it. So plot scaling. Uh, John Platt is the person I've mentioned already in this class before that was for support vector machines he was um, studying support vector machines and introduced uh, very clever things such as sequential minimum optimization where quadratic programming could be solved uh, by considering two elements um, two samples uh, at a time rather than uh, solving it all together and uh, solve it uh, essentially in a stochastic uh, manner of like a pair at a time with heuristic which pair to consider next. So we will discuss that a little bit in this class. But uh, while studying support vector machines and studying um, how to convert their predictions into confidence uh, values, um, some, some confidence values that would be useful, Platt introduced scaling, which basically amounts to taking the output of the model and support vector machine, that would be the distance uh, from the separating hyperplane, and uh, passing it through a sigmoid. Well, think about the sigmoid uh, as a single neuron with a single weight, single bias, and sigmoid output. Thresholding, remember? So bias would shift the sigmoid uh, or the, the value of um, yeah the origin rather and uh, a would stretch so two parameters to estimate a and b and uh, a and b are optimized uh, by uh, minimizing negative log likelihood on a holdout test when the neural network is already trained or the model is trained but uh, it kind of considers everything independently right it considers each output of the model um, for the neural network case it's the layer activation layer before the nonlinearities are applied the last uh, activation layer but in this case, all of the classes, Z sub i, are considered independently. So, um, we can generalize this to multi-class case. First, let's generalize the binning schema. Well, the binning is easy. We treat the problem as k, um, uh, for k class plural, we treat it as uh, one versus all. And then for a binary classification problem where the label is um, the indicator, right, whether yi falls into class k and the prediction probability is uh, uh, softmax, basically. 
So for softmax, we obtain first all of our, like we need to obtain all of our uh, predictions and then uh, our confidences and then we just predict the argmax. So those cues hat are uh, the output of our softmax function. And then um, given that setup, we will take our confidence and uh, just renormalize the confidence within each pin. So for multi-class case, we can also generalize the plat scaling instead of applying um, a, a and B parameters per class, we can have matrix W and uh, beta uh, bias vector such that it's now general, right? We can learn a W that is uh, transforming, um, linearly transforming our um, uh, output of our model in an, in an interesting way and the results that I will be showing in the, uh, further in the slides this w is diagonal because um, too many parameters right quadratic number of parameters but um, in any case a slightly general case of plots uh, scaling and then yeah that's what I said restricted to be diagonal uh, another case is, well, what if um, plot scaling and um, generalization of plot scaling, this matrix vector scaling, is um, too much? What if it has too many parameters and um, too many things to deal with? Let's just simplify it and s take a simplest possible extension or rethinking of plot scaling and use only one scalar. Uh, po uh, positive scalar for all classes temperature so given the logit vector z the new confidence prediction oh, so the z is just the output not unnormalized the output of our model um, uh, minus infinity to infinity right and um, oh no no um, sorry it's zero to infinity um, the odds ratio and uh, given the logit vector, so the confidence, let's just divide everything by the temperature. So uh, recalibration will equally penalize all of our positive and, neg like, and negative predictions and everything. It basically raises the output entropy or softens the softens the softmax function. Uh, when t is greater than 1. If t goes to infinity, probability of uh, the calibrated probability or confidence approaches 1 over k, which represents maximum uncertainty. And when t equals 1, we recover our original probabilities. So uh, when t tends to 0, probability collapses to a point mass. And t is optimized with respect to negative non non likelihood on the holdout data set, validation data set. Um, well, that, that, that's all of our parameters are like that. Then prediction remains unchanged uh, since uh, t doesn't change the maximum of the softmax function. It just softens it, softens it. And temperature scaling doesn't affect the model's accuracy. So the model accuracy is the same, it's just recalibrating it for the confidences to correspond to actual accuracies better. Surprisingly, um, and this is the paper I cite in the beginning of the lecture on calibration of modern networks 2017, surprisingly temperature scaling works the best on, uh, like on the wild class uh, of um, various models, including dense net, uh, res nets of all kinds, uh, Lenet and uh, many others. 
mostly of course um, those are wide and deep resnets and dense net including lnet um, so it's a little bit surprising very interesting uh, think about it uh, in your free time why that simple recalibration which is just a temperature or um, uniform uh, scaling of softmax function affects um, or corrects the um, confidence of the model. So this is a, a result in the confidence plots, reliability diagram. On the left, you see unscaled um, ResNet 110. And remember, in all of this plot, the same network with the same accuracy just um, calibrated differently to return different um, confidences, um, but um, not affecting the actual accuracy. Well, maybe you need to shift the threshold. And uh, as well, as uh, in the table, we see that temperature scaling uh, gives us the best um, fit to this identity line. Lots of bibliography entries, which you will be able to find in um, the PDF that I will attach to this lecture. Uh, hopefully, uh, you understood some of it, but at least you know now all of the pointers. And uh, you know, I hope, how to um, scale your model so you can use it easily in production and automate. Um, lots of routine operations and when uh, the model is less certain, uh, less confident, put the uh, uh, work back to humans' hands.